this, these principles of mass spectrometry in this very important uh, session because most of the concepts that you will see here are not ex normally explained in, 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 let's say, master courses or that in which you only have one session or two sessions of proteomics, right? There, normally, you see how to identify and quantify proteins and how actually can uh, proteomics can, can give you some results, right? But how proteomics or mass spectrometry based proteomics is, is working and how mass spectrometers are working is something that we, I would like to review in this next hour. And the first question is, what is a mass spectrometer? Right? And this would be the first question when we try to do mass spectrometry based proteomics. And a mass spectrometer is nothing else than a device that enables to distinguish chemical entities with different mass, ratio, mass to charge ratio. So anything that has a different mass to charge ratio, a mass spectrometer is in principle able to separate this. And this is the, one of the first, actually, it's the third mass spectrometer in the world. Well, actually, it's a replica of the third one, right? And you can see here, so this is a bottle of, or the source, a bottle containing gas, ionized gas, and it's a source of ions. So in that particular case, this was 1913, so more than one, 100 years ago, they analyzed gas, gases, charged gases, okay? Here is the, the mass analyzer, so an electrical field that actually enables us to separate this different mass to charge ratio, and here there would be a detector. And this can be better seen in what it's called the Croc, well, Thompson is considered the father of, of mass spectrometry, and this is an illustration of the Croc tube, but that he used at some point, but the important thing is here, you get the ion source, right, with an anode and a cathode, so this generates ionized particles of gas, this Particles that are charged can travel here, and if they would not be charged, they would follow a straight line until the detector. What they did here is they put an electric field. So these just two plates with different voltage. So if, as you know, if something is charged, it will deflect, right? And instead of following uh, a straight line, it will go up or it will go down depending on the charge. And here in the detector, that at those days it was like a film, a pic, uh, photographic film, so you can actually record the degree of separation or deflection of these particles. And actually, let's see one of these pictures, right? So this is one of the pictures, for, uh, again, so from 1913, in which Thompson was able to separate different, different atoms with, with different charges. For example, here we have charge one and charge two, and they deflect as you can see, different because they have different mass to charge ratio. And also, most importantly, he was able to separate neon 20 from neon 22, right? And this was the first time someone actually had evidence of the existence of isotopes, right? So molecules or, well, in this case, atoms with the same atomic number but different amount of, of neutrons, right? And with mass spectrometry, they were, so they, they were able to actually see how these deflect in a different way because they have, even though they might have the same charge, they have different mass to charge ratio, right? Similarly, so this is what is called the calotron, right? And so this is a big hole here, just to get the, the, the dimension of this. So here is a man, a person here. So these dozens of mass spectrometers that they were used in the 40s to actually separate isotope 235 from 248 of uranium as part of the Manhattan Project to make the atomic bomb. So they took uh, uranium, natural uranium, and with these mass spectrometers uh, that, as you know, they can separate, right, by mass to charge ratio, so they were enriching uranium. And this was the way mass spectrometers, or one of the applications of mass spectrometry in, in the old 40s. Next slide is this, so this is the Curiosity robot, right? So this has, this is one of these robots that was, that was launched 2011 from, from Florida and landed in Mars 2012, right? And a part of, well, this is high, high technology device, right? So it has the four wheels to navigate, GPS, and, and a, an, an arm to explore, but, but I want to, you to 
So here, so to focus on here, here there is what they call the sample analysis on Mars. And if we zoom here and take a picture of this, what we found, find is that this is nothing else than this box here that contains a quadrupole mass spectrometer and a gas chromatography part. So mass spectrometers are also used actually to, to for in these high technology expeditions to, to actually spaceships, you know, in spaceships to explore our universe. And currently, we can also use mass spectrometers, right, as in biomedical research. So top leading biomedical research also uses mass spectrometry, and this is one of the newest applications of mass spectrometry, actually, uh, to do so or to characterize sex signaling processes, structure of protein complexes, identifying and quantifying post-translational modifications, identify or, or know the CIFR drug mechanism, and also do cancer cell molecular characterization among others. And this is how a current mass spectrometry looks like uh, with all these plastic covers, right? And we will see this also when we go in, in, in the unit afterwards. But let's go back to, to here, right? To our Thomson uh, initial experiments and then start defining, defining some basic concepts that in which mass spectrometry is based. And the first one is mass, right? Mass, we can define, I mean, there are different ways of defining mass, and, but from the, from the classical physics approach, it, would, it could be defined as two ways. So the first way is based on the law of universal gravitation, and the mass would, would be the physical property of a body that determines the strength of mutual attraction. Right? as given from the law of universal gravitatory. And a second definition would be the, so the mass is the resistance of an object of being accelerated by a force. So the bigger the mass, the more force you have to do to, to an object to, to accelerate it, right? And this would be definition of mass. Then how we, how we um, quantify or which units we, we use to to measure these masses, right? So one would be in the international system, kilograms, but in mass spectrometry, we use what is called the unified atomic mass unit, or Dalton, right? Which is the standard, and it's defined by definition as one twelfth of the mass of carbon 12, right? And by, also by definition, the mass of carbon 12, and this unit is 12, okay? So this is one twelfth, so one U or one Dalton, it's one twelfth of the mass of, of the carbon. And then we can express these masses as what we call the nominal mass, which would be the integral mass. So we say, well, carbon is 12, or hydrogen is 1, nitrogen is 14, as you know. But we also know that this is not true, right? So hydrogen does not weight exactly 1, but it weights 1 point something, right? And then we can say, well, let's talk about the monoisotopic mass, which is the exact mass of the most abundant isotopes. And this is important because we already saw that in nature there are several isotopes, so we should refer to one of them. And then we say, well, let's talk about the most abundant isotopes. So for carbon, it's carbon-12, and it weights 12.00. For hydrogen, there is deuterium, but uh, um, the most abundant would be hydrogen-1, and this weights 1.008 nitrogen, so this is for nitrogen-14, so this would be the, the monoisotopic mass. But then we can also talk about average mass, which is the average of all the isotopes. So this is taking into account that in nature there are also other, other isotopes. And for example, in the case of, of carbon, so there is, as you know, carbon-13. So when we weight and we do the weighted average of, of this, of both carbon-12 and carbon-13, what we get is that the average mass of atom carbon, without taking into account uh, or specifying a specific isotope, is this one. And when we talk about atom hydrogen, is this one, and nitrogen is this one. As you can see, for example, hydrogen is almost the same because actually the relative abundance of deuterium in nature is very, very low. And we, you can see this in the following table. And what we should take care is about carbon-12 for two reasons. The first one is because compared to any other, uh, any other mm, atom, is the percentage of carbon-13 is 
over 1%. For example, in deuterium, it's less than 0.001, right? And, and the second is that biomolecules have a lot of carbons, right? And this will, will mean that in our normal, normal proteins, we will have both carbon-12 and carbon-13. And this will determine the type of signal that we see in the mass spectrometer. So this is a very important slide because here is the first definition of what is a mass spectrum, right? When we talk about spectrum that we get from, from, from the mass spectrometer, so this is it, right? And it's nothing else than a plot of intensity and mass to charge in the x, in the x axis. So here we plot the mass to charge, like for example, if this would be uh, carbon 12 charge 1, this would be 12, okay? And then for this particular mass to charge uh, molecule, we see the intensity of it. And this is uh, what we call a spectrum. So here, when we have one, one carbon, we see, so this would be 12, and we see this, this peak here. We also see another small peak here. And the question, or the, the important thing here, is that we are not measuring just one molecule, but a population of molecules. Okay? So there will be, as we saw before, 99% that have charge, mass to charge 12, considering charge 1, and 1% which will be carbon 13. Right? So you can see that in mass spectrometry, we don't get just one signal per molecule, but actually we get in this case, two signals per molecule because of the isotope effect, okay? So we have some isotopes, and this is here. But this gets more complicated when we increase the number of, of atoms of a molecule because the chances that at least one of the atoms in that particular molecule has a carbon-13 instead of carbon-13 increases. And then you get this, so for example, if instead of analyzing a population of molecules with just one carbon, we analyze a population of molecules with 10 carbons, then this increases quite a lot, and this increases even more when we analyze things like peptides that can have 50 atoms of carbon, or even more and more, right? Give it, and until a point that even it's more likely that the, atom, the molecules have at least one carbon-13 than zero or than zero, right? So this peak here, it's what we call the monoisotopic peak. And this refers to a all the molecules in this population that have no carbon 13s. So these are all molecules that have carbon, all, all their carbons are carbons 12. Whereas, and you can see that given a molecule that have almost 200 carbons, it's l the more likely the scenario is that they have each, each each molecule has at least one or two or even three carbon-13 per molecule. And this gives us a very complex data process or signaling processes problem or challenge, right? So we, in, in, in contrast to other techniques, like for example, Western blot, where you have just a signal, more or less intense. So here, for every molecule, so we have a bunch of signals. And you can, so if these are pure molecules, but you can imagine now a cell extract with 10,000 proteins. We digest these to peptides. Let's assume 10 peptides per protein. This would make a population of 10,000 different analytes, and each of them gives this type of signal, okay? So it's quite complicated to actually identify which is which and which um, or batch of signals conform what we call an isotope peak. So meaning that this, we know that these are corresponding to different isotopes, but actually we are sure that this is one single molecule, well, or one single compound. Excuse me, Aline Yenera, um, when you, you have, I don't know, 100 molecules of uh, 10 carbon, no, mm -hmm. carbons, more or less the average of carbon-12 and carbon-13 is the same across all the uh, proteins of our body or not? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you can have, no? You can have uh, like yes, so let's say, so given the, the number of carbons, we can actually, let's say, simulate which, which is the expected amount of carbons that we will, that we will see in these signals. And, and we can actually say, well, so peptides should, for example, have more or less this type of, of signals here. 
and we can we can kind of predict this. Okay. Any more questions on this? Okay. The first one is the, the first uh, point, no? the first bit is the you have uh, all the, the isotopic one, no? so all the carbons are 12. So most okay. more complex, no? I, I don't know. Yes, uh, here, for example. See, yes. All the carbons are, are 12. Carbons. Exactly. In the last one, always the same. No? I imagine that percentage between 12 and 13 is more or less uh, stable, and so the last one is not, the, is, for example, so always. The, uh, 50% of the carbons are 13? No, well, that? so this would be all, so all carbons are 12. Okay. This one would be, okay. because, no, so this one would be all carbons except one wow. is 13, because here, I mean, there is no scale, right? But I can mm -hmm. tell you that the difference between this and this is one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know that this is because of one, one something that weights one more. And this is carbon 13. And this would be all the molecules with, carbo with two carbons 13 mm -hmm. in their skeleton, and so on and so forth. OK? Any more doubts on this? OK, good. So then we advance to what we call also an, uh, another, the mass resolving power, and which is an also another very important concept. And this concept relies on the fact that there is some uncertainty when measuring the mass of an analyte. So we don't exactly know the mass of what we are, we are measuring, right? So we get this type of peaks. And as you can see, this is not just a line, but it's a distribution, OK? And then we can actually take the mean of this distribution and say, well, this is the exact mass of, of, this, of this molecule. But given the fact that there is a distribution, so this distribution or this uncertainty on the measurement can be very, very narrow or very big. And the bigger it gets, the more complicated our signal gets also, because then we start mixing isotopes, right? So here, for example, if this is one, one isotope and this would be the following one with one carbon-13, there is one Dalton of difference, there is no, no no problem saying, well, this is the monoisotopic and this is one, as we were seeing before, right? In here, it's much more complicated. And then to, to, or to measure this uncertainty on measuring the sample, we define the resolution, which is the mass divided the, the delta mass. So this, the mass of this, which would be, for example, 40, 50, divided this uncertainty that we have here, which is 0 0.1. And this results in a resolution in this case, of 50. Okay? It's important also to, to, to notice that actually the same resolution, as it depends on the mass, will give different degrees of uncertainty depending on the mass. Right? So this is also resolution 50, because we have the mass, which is 500 divided 1, resolution 50, okay? like just applying the molecule. But here, the uncertainty is much bigger. And we, if we go to 1,000, it's even worse. Right? So when we acquire data in a given resolution, this given resolution is set at a given mass. And we say we, op we are operating the, the mass spectrometry at 30,000 resolution, which is a current resolution that, that it's often used in, in the laboratory, at 400, at 400, for example. Right? And then one has to see whether, if you are measuring things at 1,000, this resolution is enough or not to actually uh, have a uh, good value for your mass measurement. And this is very important because actually, depending on the resolution, we can have this type of plots, okay, where we define very well and we distinguish very well all the isotopes, and we can say, well, this is the average mass of this molecule, but actually I know the monoisotopic mass. So I know the mass that of the molecule that does not contain any carbon-13, right? And this helps me knowing the, which is this molecule, okay? If I have lower resolution, then things get worse. And at some point, I can only see this, this fuzzy, fuzzy peak, okay? Which actually only tells me that on average, whatever this disease, it has a mass of 5,700, okay? And this is actually very important. And the, so currently, we are using, as I said, over 
30,000 resolution, and for most of the peptides, we, we have um, this kind of, of patterns, right, in which we can define very well all the isotope peak and know which is the monoisotopic mass. This gets a bit more complicated when we, we analyze, uh, for, for example, intact proteins, right, that has bigger masses, and then this same resolution that worked very well at, let's say, 400 mass, when we go at 4,000, this resolution is not enough. And then we are in situations, for example, like this one. Okay, but we will see also a little bit more afterwards. Good. Okay, then another thing is the mass accuracy. And the mass accuracy determines the mass error. So what is the observed mass that I see in my mass spectrometer, which is the theoretical mass, and this is relative t to the, the observed mass. Okay, so for example, in this case, bradykinin, so this is the observed mass, this is the, what I get from the mass spectrometer, this is the theoretical mass, so I can do the equation, so I divide, well, I subtract the one to the other, I do the, the division, and this gives me a lot of zeros, right? And normally I could put this, for example, in percentage, but this would be still a very low percentage. And actually mass spectrometry, what we use is instead of percentage, we put everything relative to one million. And then instead of saying 1%, we talk about parts per million. Okay, instead of saying one part per 100, which would be 1%, we, we multiply this, which is e to, to minus six per one million, and we talk about 48 parts per million. So it's very common to say, well, I have a mass error or mass tolerance of 50 ppms or 20 ppms or whatever. And this you will, you will actually use for doing your database search. So one of the, the typical things that um, like search engines like Mascot or even Andromeda in Maxcon ask is, well, which is your mass tolerance, right? And then for this, you have to know what units we are talking about. And normally these are ppms. And second and most important thing is how you acquire the data. Because depending on how you acquire the data, you will have more or less mass error. Okay? Good. Questions uh, for these concepts? No? Okay, so you had yeah, one? The mass accuracy is related to the resolution. Yes, yes. It's, it's somehow related. I mean, we use the Mm. So, the mass accuracy would 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 be more into the the up, you know the the central point of this, whereas the resolution would would be more into the this this uncertainty, the, the variability, right? Uh, so you could have, let's say, a very broad peak, but still do it very well on the mean. And then you would have a very low resolution, but actually a very good mass accuracy. But of course, so the more uncertainty you have, also the more uncertain you are about the mass, the exact mass. Okay, good. So then, so if these concepts are clear, and if not, we, we I mean, we can stop and, and, and review any of them if necessary, but if not, we will, we'll go back to our, to our schema of what is a mass spectrometer, right? And this, I mean, you have already seen, we have already explained, right? And now what I would like to do is to review the parts of this mass spectrometer. So we, we said here there is the gas with a cathode and an anode, and this is actually what we call the ion source, right? So where the ions come from. Then we applied here an uh, electric field to actually separate this these charged molecules, so deflect them, and finally we detect them in the detector. So we have a mass analyzer that allows us to separate these mass to charge different particles. We have a detector and we have an ion source. So let's start with the ion source and then we will see the analyzers and we'll see the detectors. So at the beginning, as I said, so most of the mass spectrometry was based on gases. 
So putting something into the gas phase and charge was very easy, but uh, because actually <laughs> scientists at that point, at, at the early 90s, uh, so uh, at the early 90s, uh, they were working with, with elemental gases, right? So it was easy to put this. Then in the 1950s, so organic chemists started to use mass spectrometry to characterize small organic molecules and volatile samples, and this was were actually also very easy to put in the gas phase and charge and have them charge. But then in the 80s, so biologists also get in, got interested into mass spectrometry and said, well, if I can measure these small molecules, why ca cannot I measure also some peptides and proteins because this would give me a lot of information of my cells and my tissues. And the thing is that these, these biomolecule, biomolecules are very large and normally they are non-volatile molecules. And to put them in the, or to measure them in the mass spec, we need to put them in the gas phase. So they have to be not in liquid phase, not in solid phase, but in gas phase. And not only this, but they have to be charged. Okay? And the thing is that to put a molecule of this size, such as a peptide or a molecule or a protein, into the gas phase, we have to put energy in the system. And if we put energy into a peptide or a protein, it's quite likely that it breaks. Right? And this is what it was happening for many years in the mass spectrometry field. So that peptides and proteins were not able to be analyzed, even though they were very interesting to analyze to be measured by mass spectrometry, no one could measure them. Then there were some first attempts, like fast atom bombardment, to actually ionize and put them into the gas phase, but it was not until the, the, the appearance of new ionization techniques, like the electrospray in MALDI, that probably many of you already know, that actually we were able to analyze peptides and proteins. So electrospray was, was uh, discovered by, by Fenn and Maldi by Tanaka, and both of them got a Nobel Prize for this. I also have to say that Thomson also got a Nobel Prize for, for discovering mass spectrometry, right? And then, so electrospray is a liquid phase ionization. It's time limited because what we are doing is we are actually, this is a chromatographic column or a needle. We are spraying thing, uh, a solution of peptides or proteins, and then we generate this electrospray here, right? And therefore it's time limited. So the entire sample is being sprayed and we cannot repeat any measurement. Well, unless we inject again the same sample. And it can be implemented in many types of instruments. In, in MALDI, which stands for MALDI's Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization, it's a solid phase ionization. So this is actually solid. It, we put the sample, we will see if it afterwards. We put the sample together with a matrix in a plate, and then we use a laser to actually excitate these molecules, transfer some energy, and put them in the gas phase. So we can actually resample this. We can resample because actually we can go to another place of this spot and, and put the laser there and take another sample. And it's mainly implemented in, in a type of instrument that is called TOF instruments that we will also see afterwards. So in a bit more detail, so these are, this is the electrospray, how it works. So we have, for example, a chromatographic column. So we have a peptide mixture that we are separating here. We apply a different of voltage, as you can see, between the column and the mass spectrometer. That introduces some, some electric field here to, to direct these particles. We also, in the chromatography uh, separation, we use acidic conditions so that we, we ensure that each peptide has a positive, mol a positive charge. So we have peptides that are positively charged in the liquid phase, and then we spray. And these sprays, we can, as they are charged and we have a difference of voltage, we can direct it to the mass spec. Okay? How these little droplets, or which is the mechanism that, that, that accomplish that these little molecules or these little droplets with molecules and charges get into the gas phase, the exact mechanism is not very well understood. But there are some theories on, on how this electrospray really works. Right? One of them is what is called the ion evaporation mechanism that is mainly proposed for small molecules, as, as stated here. And it says that the charges in the, in the big droplet are localized in the surface, and then that the small droplets go out uh, from this uh, precursor or big, big droplet, and then we get our particles with a charge in the gas phase. Okay. 
Another way to see, or another proposed mechanism, especially for larger mo molecules such as peptides or, or proteins, is what is called the charge residue mechanism, in which we have this droplet with our analyte, in this case a protein, with, with water and some charges, and this gets evaporated, right? So it gets evaporated, and then the charges stays in the, in the protein that is rearranged so that Pro the, the charges, the pro these protons that we have in solution can be localized at different points of the protein without any water. And then we have a protein which is charged and in the gas phase. And this we can direct it into the mass spectrometer. Okay? So, the main characteristics of electrospray ionization is that it's, first of all, very sensitive to contaminants. Also, you, ha you probably have heard well, watch out with detergents and other surfactants when preparing your samples because this actually spoils the, the, <coughs> the electrospray. All sample is consumed during the analysis. It produces, because of what we see, what we saw, multiple charged ions. So this means that our molecule here, uh, represented as an M, so it can have one charge, two charge, three charge, so on and so forth, right? So it can we can have multiple charge in, in, a, in a given peptide. Solution phase ionization, right? So the, the ionization happens in the solution phase, phase right, in, in liquid, and this enables coupling to a chromatography. And this is very convenient because we can separate peptides and online uh, do the spray and introduce these peptides into the mass spectrometer. It's capable of ionizing very large molecules, right? So we can also ionize in this way protein and protein complexes, and it's a soft ionization technique. And this is actually very, very important, right? Because this means that there is little fragmentation during the ionization, and we can analyze peptides and proteins without breaking them. In the case of MALDI, what we have is a laser that introduces energy into the system, right, to bring these molecules into the gas phase. But instead of doing directly, what we use are these matrices. These matrices, I mean, now it's not very important which are exactly these matrices, but it's more important their function. So they are co-crystallized with our molecules. So here, what we have is our molecules plus these matrices. And these matrices, what they do is absorb the energy of the laser and transfer it indirectly to our molecules. So it's a soft way of providing energy to our molecules and transfer them from the, the solid phase, in this case, to the gas phase, right? Because we need them in the gas phase and in, char in charge to be able to analyze them in the mass spectrometer. So and the main characteristics is that sample preparation is very simple. We just mix our sample with this matrix and we let them dry in a plate. It's also very or relatively insensitive to contaminants. It's, it's, or it, it's used in a way that only a small fraction of the sample is consumed by each analysis. So we can change where we, we spot the laser and get a reanalysis of the same sample, right? And this is not possible, for instance, with electrospray. It produces normally single charge ions. And again, so it's a soft ionization technique. Right? And this is the main characteristic, again. And also it enables, in contrast to, to electrospray, so, for example, uh, MALDI imaging, it's called, so that we can actually analyze uh, the special distribution of certain molecules. These are brain tissue, I think, slices. And we can ask which are, or in, in which parts, I see more signal of my favorite molecule. And this is able or we can do this with MALDI, we cannot do this with electrospray ionization. So, any questions on, on the ion source? Yeah, a question on the MALDI. Uh, <coughs> so, here, not all the ions are charged positively. Also so, most of the charge is positive. But, depending on the composition of your, of, of your, mm, well, of your analyte. Right? You can also operate mass spectrometers in the positive mode or in the negative mode. This is something I, I didn't say because normally we operate 
them f to analyze peptides and proteins in the positive mode, but actually in many, in many applications for small molecules, people operate them in negative mode because they, they, they deal with molecules that are normally negatively charged. Mm. The last application, you have saved with money. Mm -hmm. It means that you could have uh, <coughs> tissue on the on the, on the plate, on the multi plate, so and we scan. The tissue. Yes. So you can define uh, each, each part of the tissue, how many expression, or how many proteins are you know, of each type. Yes. Like yes, exactly. I mean, this is the concept. It's very easy with, or, or relatively easy with the small molecules. It's more complicated with peptides and proteins because you have to digest them and extract them, right? Without distorting the structure of the tissue, mm -hmm. right? And then, so, but for drug placement or localization, this is very convenient, for example. Any questions? No? So then we will, right, so we have reviewed the ion source, and now we will <coughs> go in, into more depth into the mass analyzers, right? And here we, we already see in this prototype or these early days mass spectrometer that this can be uh, an electrical field or even a magnetic field that also can, can direct different type of, of ions in one way or another and we will enable us to separate different mass to charge particles. So mass analyzers separate ions according to two laws, right? The Newton's second law, which is what we are, have already seen, force equals mass and acceleration, and the Lorentz force law. That relates force with the, <coughs> with the charge of the molecule, the electrical field, and the magnetic field, which is expressed by this vector product. So it's easy, actually, to, to equalize this or substitute this force here by MA. So we would have MA equals charge, electrical part, magnetic part. In this way, <coughs> we know, or we can know, how the mass to charge ratio depends on the electric field or the magnetic field, and also we will know how the mass to charge ratio, depending on this, how it's accelerated. And different electric or magnetic fields, uh, given a certain mass to charge ratio, will provide a different acceleration. And with different accelerations, we can actually separate molecules. And this is one of the main principles of the first mass analyzer that I would like to introduce today, which is the time of flight. Okay, in time of flight, what we do, you can see here already, right, a very rudimentary diagram of a MALDI source, right? So this is the sample holder, this is the laser, so we ionize this, and we put these molecules that are here in my sample in the gas phase. Here we apply an electric, <coughs> an electric field, no magnetic field, but just electric field. And then, <coughs> depending on the mass to charge ratio, we give different acceleration of these molecules. And then we let them drift freely until the detector, right? So the bigger, so given the same charge, let's assume they have all the same charge, the, the more mass they will have, they will have less acceleration by definition of the mass, which is the resistance to be accelerated, right? And they will reach later the detector than this small particle here. So we can actually relate mass to charge to the time that they take from the ion source to the detector. And in this way, we can say, well, this particle here, I don't know what it is, but I know it took 10 seconds to, to, uh, to reach the detector. Therefore, it should have a mass to charge ratio of 400. This one here took 12 seconds, so it should have a mass to charge ratio of 500, and so on, so forth for each of them. Okay, and this is one of the mass analyzers, the time of flight or TOF, that we are currently using in our daily applications. So one important thing is that, and this uh, is that uh, molecules, when as they are um, heated by a laser and we introduce some energy, they don't have the same kinetic energy at the, at the very beginning, right? And to normalize this, what, what current or current mass and tough mass analyzers have is this deflector, 
Okay? And this tries to equalize uh, molecules that have the same mass to charge ratio but with lower and higher initial kinetic energy. Right? So the bigger kinetic energy they have, the more deep they will penetrate this reflector and the lower energy they have, the, the less they will penetrate. So at the end or at the exit of this reflector, they are both equalized. So in this way, we reduce the uncertainty of the mass, the mass, the mass um, calculation. And you can see that this results in much better resolution. So this was before or without the reflector. This is the type of signal that we would have. And this is um, the signal we have with time of flight analyzer that incorporate a reflector. Right? You can see that the resolution is much better. And also here, as you can imagine, all modern tough mass analyzers have a reflector that increases the resolution of, of the analysis. Time of flight, therefore, is what we call a scanning or a screening mass analyzer. Okay, because, so this is a mass spectrum as we see, saw before, but this is a real one, more complex, right? So we have different masses or mass to charge values and different intensities here, right? So <clears throat> in this particular case, I'm seeing so some here, other here, right? A lot of analytes that are reaching my mass spectrometer detector at, at the same time, well, or at, at a given moment, right? And it's a screen mass analyzer because in one shot, so in one acceleration, and just letting them hit the detector, I can screen or scan all the mass range. So I know different masses, how much of them they are in, in my sample, okay? This is important because other mass analyzers do not have this behavior. And one of them is the quadrupole. And the quadrupole, as the name says, it's a device that has four poles or rods, as you can see here, one, two, three, and four, right? Also here. And here what we can do is actually apply current and, and radio frequency so that when ions, so you can, you can imagine that ions, so this would be the ion source, they come here, and they go through this quadrupole, okay? And depending on the settings of these radio frequencies and current, only one mass to charge will have a stable or a straight direction so that it can enter here and go out here. Okay, this can be better seen in this other. So I have a source of ions, so lots of them with a lot of proteins or peptides. And then I set certain conditions here of electricity so that only one of them, in this case the red one, manages to actually pass through the quadrupole and reach the detector. All the others have other trajectories that will collide into the, into the quadrupole or will go out so that they don't, uh, they don't reach the detector. And this is very important because quadrupole, quadruples are what we call filtering devices. So in this case, in contrast to what we have seen in the TOF, I can decide I want to actually see this peptide because this is the one I want I'm interested in. I don't care about anything else. And then I get a signal just for this peptide, right? So here, for example, I was interested. So this probably, well, this is uh, a small molecule. And, and I'm setting the quadruple in a way that I'm saying, just let this 195 pass. Of course I have, so it's not so exact, but I have, right, plus minus something. But this plus minus something is normally one Dalton or so, one unit. And therefore, this is what I see, all the others, I don't see it. And this improves quite a lot our sensitivity of detection. So, so if you could have both um, analyzers, and the first one you put it off, what you have analyzed is time. Time of, of arrival of the ions. Mm -hmm. So you, and if there's one time, you uh, translate to n seven. Yes. And here, you choose the frequency. Yes. So you let pass the ions. Mm -hmm. How many ions to this frequency arrive to the Exactly, exactly. So here we relate, so this I, I skipped, right? But we relate M over M, so mass to charge ratio to frequency, right? So we set a frequency and we get, uh, we can filter for a mass. 
What? So we would you so the question is whether we would you lose a lot of ions. Yeah. So we would you we will lose all the ions that do not have this mass. Mm -hmm. Then if you are going for example yeah, try <coughs> frequencies. So for example we could try different frequencies, but in some applications like targeted proteomics that we will see on, on Wednesday, so you could decide to use quadruples to say, well, I only want to quantify this pattern, nothing else. Right? And then you use this as a filter and you just quantify that one. Okay? Yeah? Yes, in, uh, in this case they use, in uh, the example that you put the before, mm -hmm. of uh, this uh, curiosity that they, when they uh, yeah? go to Mars, they use this one. Why? Why? Yes. Bec so probably because quadruples are very, very robust. So quadruple among the different the different ty types of mass spectrometers that or an mass analyzers that we have, quadruples are the by far the more robust. For example, this time of flight, of course, the temperature the temperature influences on how, on the kinetics of of the molecules, right? And and the time. And we, for example, TOFs have to be calibrated almost every day, and quadruples have to be calibrated once per year. And this is why. Yes? Sorry, I didn't how it works uh, Okay. Okay, so, I mean, is it well understood why we need the reflector? Okay, I mean, we need the reflection, the reflector, because when we start here, as we introduce some energy, the, the molecules that we, we introduce here do not have the same initial kinetic energy, okay? And then, even if we accelerate them, so, so it can happen that things that have the same mass have different acceleration because some of this acceleration was coming from the very beginning, from this excitation part, right? And what we try is to actually say, well, if there are things that have the same mass to charge ratio, we want them to have the same acceleration. So somehow we have to uh, reduce this initial kinetic energy. And we do this by introducing this reflector that is actually, again, so everything is related to voltages and, and electric fields. And we, we put this so that we change the direction of these, of these ions in a way that if two masses have exactly the same, ma well, two particles have exactly the same mass to charge ratio, but different kinet initial kinetic energies, one of them, the one that has more kinetic energy, will penetrate a bit more than the other. And then when they go out, they will be both equal, right? And in this way, we have eliminated this initial noise of the kinetic energy. And this is what, why we can have much more resolution. <clears throat> okay, so we were in the quadruples and saying that this is a mass analyzer that can filter things. And then of course, so this I could, I could get this, right? So for one particular an analysis in one particular time. And then what I can also do is say, well, let's see. So I'm analyzing my sample. So I can analyze at this given point and say, well, is my, so what's happening with this mass? And I see a mass here. Then after 10 seconds or one second, I can ask, well, what is happening? And I see that it's increasing and then it's decreasing, right? So I'm doing like, screenshots, right, of whether my, my, my analyte is there or not. And then, so if this is a chromatography, what I can do is actually I can join these points here and draw similar to what we would call a, cro a chromatogram. This is actually not a UV-based chromatogram, but a ionogram. So this means that it, this chromatogram is based on the intensity of our ions. Right? And then I see that my peak is eluting at minute two, for, for instance. And, and therefore, I can say, well, not only I have my mass of interest, but I also have an area under the curve that I can use to quantify this. Right? So I can use quadruples, not 
not only to see whether my particular molecule of interest is in my sample, but I can use them also to, to actually get these chromatograms and quantify the area under the curve. Okay, so we've seen TOF analyzers, which are scanning devices, quadruples, which are filters, and now what I would like is to introduce the linear ion trap. And this actually a quadruple, as you can see, because it has, again, four poles, so one here, two, three, and four, but it's operated in a way that we can trap ions here, then we can filter them, or we can actually say we want only to trap those that have a particular mass or mass to charge ratio and that let them in to the detector. Okay? And I would to illustrate this, I would like to put uh, a video, right? In which so here are the two rods. I'm not sure maybe we can close the turn off the lights. Yes, okay. Yes. So Right, so this is one rod, this is another rod. This, the green light is because we have, well, the, the author of the video has put a, a laser here, and this is, this is empty, right? So I can, I, if I could, I could put my, my hand be, behind and my, high, my hand uh, in front, right? And we are not using, or he will not be using ions, but actually, because we, otherwise we would not see them, but actually, charged particles. Hello again, uh, we're back looking at the electrodynamic ion traps experiment from Newtonian Labs. And what we've done now is we switched to the uh, linear trap and uh, you can look at the documentation to see the geometry of the trap. Okay, and then the camera is looking down from the side and, uh, and I think it will become clear when we put some particles in, so let's do that. We'll just turn up the uh, field and put a bunch of particles in. Okay, so there they are, lots of particles. And what's happening is the trap is a two-dimensional trap, it's linear, so there's trapping in two dimensions. So that's the vertical dimension as you see it, and the direction in and out of the, uh, the screen. Okay, that's the, those are the main trapping direction. The uh, left to right, uh, there's very little trapping because it's a linear trap. We have these Teflon end caps that keep the particles uh, centered to some degree though. So. And here's the, the wand. I can put it in here. That's the wand. See, the wand will repel particles like so. It's great fun. You can push uh, particles around using just the wand. So those are the electric fields from the wand. I charged the wand up, you see. And so it's negatively charged, and it will push those particles around. And so, uh, as I like to say, you can literally poke a stick at these uh, ion traps by sticking this wand in and see what it, seeing what it does. So there's, uh, there's my hand in the background, those are my fingers. Okay, those are outside, outside the trap. Okay. So I can turn the trap, let's let me try to get that up. Okay. So, let's do put some more particles in. So there we have that, and I'll just charge up my wand, stick it in there. And uh, there's a bunch of particles, okay? So uh, they repel each other, and so they don't fall to the center of the trap, the center being a line in this case, uh, but instead they're spread out. So they're uh, uh, being pushed toward the center, toward a line in the center by the trap, and then the mutual repulsion uh, keeps them apart. There's air currents that push them around a little because the trap is kind of open. And then finally there are the end caps that keep the, the particles centered in the trap. So there's a lot going on all at once. Uh, and again, if you look in the documentation, you can see the uh, geometry and that'll make it a little clearer. Now I have a DC uh, voltage I can put on as well that'll apply, apply a static uh, electric field and so a static force. If I turn that down, then gravity pulls the particles down. If I turn it up, then the field will pull the particles up. Some of them will go away. And I can just tune it to the middle and then uh, basically gravity is being uh, cancelled. Okay, so I've got gravity pulling the particles down and the DC electric field pushing the particles up and those two can cancel if I uh, do it right. Okay, and so the particles will float in the center. But again, there's this Coulomb repulsion that keeps the cloud uh, separate. So what I'm going to do now is I will turn the AC trap down 
and it gets weaker and the particles will start to leave because they get pulled up or pushed down from gravity uh, pulled from gravity and and pulled up from the electric fields and so I'll select particles okay those with a lot of charge will get pulled up those with not very much charge will get pulled down and uh, in the middle they all have fairly uniform charge, pretty much the same charge. So now if I turn this up a little bit, uh, now you see they're all, whoops, peeking a little bit of dust in there. There, that's not too bad. Uh, now you see that they're pretty much on a line. I've seen, right, how he can drop everything here, then how he tunes the voltage, actually, to move them up and down, how they do not cluster, all together in the center because actually as they are all charged they also repulse each other and then how now he also tune the voltage so that he homogenize the, the population of particles and this is exactly what we do with ion traps in, in our mass spectrometers so this would not be charged particles but charged peptides and we say well we trap them all together and then we can actually tune the the, the the electrical field in a way that we only isolate the ones that we are interested in, for instance, and then we release them into the detector. Or we can also release them so slowly to the detector at different type of, of voltages. So, and this is how an ion trap works. And actually, again, so the inventor of the, the ion trap, which is Wolfgang Paul, so he also got the, the Nobel Prize for, for, for this. Right, and then, so the linear ion trap <clears throat> can be, as you've seen, a screening and a filtering device, right? So this depends on how we, how we operate the radio frequency in the electrical field, and we can do both things with the same type of mass, mass, mass analyzer. And finally, the, so we have seen the, the TOF, the quadruple, the ion trap, and now the last mass analyzer that I would like to, to talk about are the Fourier transfer mass analyzers, right? <clears throat> and in these cases, what we do is we actually excitate the ions, we let them relax, and then we record a transient in time that we afterwards, with a mathematical tool, which is called a Fourier transform, we can pass this into the frequency uh, domain, and from the frequency domain, we can deduce the, the M over Z, okay? There are two types of of mass analyzers that are working with Fourier transform, which are the ion cyclotron resonance, which is based on magnetic fields, and the orbitrap, which is probably also a mass analyzer that you have heard about, right? And it's using this Fourier transform uh, strategy, but instead of using a magnetic field, it uses an electric, electrostatic field, okay? And in these cases, so both of them are screening or scanning mass analyzers, so meaning that in one shot we can actually have all the data for all the different M over Zs and their relative intensity according to how many ions have reached the detector. And so here I also have a small video to actually understand this better. So here you can see, so this would be the chromatography part that we charge, we see the electrospray, so these are the drops. We do a zoom here. So you see the, this dro little drop with charged particles, how the solvent is evaporated, how charges are rearranged. And then we have them, the ions or the peptides in the gas phase. So these enter these, these quadruples. You can see these are quadruples or octopoles, right? Just to drive or to guide the ions into, into the analyzer. And this would be the Fourier transfer mass analyzer. We have now our, our ions here. We apply a radio frequency, right, to excitate them. And then we let them relax. And we, with this, we record their motions, right, on time. And this, this is what we, we saw the trans here in time, that afterwards we will be able to convert this complex signal using a Fourier transform into the, so we acquire this in time, right? This is a complex, so we apply this Fourier transform. We have the frequency domain, and then this with a simple formula, we can actually 
convert it into a mass spectrum. Okay, and this is the basis of, for example, the orbit trap mass analyzer. Okay, so an important thing, and so these are all the mass analyzers that I, want, I wanted to review in this course. Time of flight, quadruple, ion trap, and Fourier transform based mass analyzers such as the orbit trap. And one very important thing is that for all the concepts that we have seen at the beginning of the talk, each of these mass analyzers perform differently. For example, in terms of mass accuracy, right, so time of flight and ion trap are very have very good mass accuracy, whether quadrupole that allow us to filter molecules, but it has a very bad mass accuracy. And this is also why we, we can say, well, I want to filter this mass of 400, but actually it will be 400 plus minus one, for instance. Then the same thing happens with resolution, being time of flight with reflecton and orbit trap, the ones that have better resolution, and then similar to the speed, right? So we have, the, um, mass analyzers like time of flight that are very fast and others that, that can only trigger 20 or even 15 spectra per, per, per second, right? And the final figure is the mass range. So we, this is what mass ranges we can actually analyze in this particular mass analyzer. And this also ranges normally from very few like 50 Daltons or mass over M over Z to one or 2000, except for time of flight that actually is able to analyze a much larger M over Z range. So any questions on mass analyzers? No? Okay, so then the only thing it's left is the detector. You saw that uh, we could have, or we could use a, a photographic film as a detector as, as it was used in, in the early days. But currently we use three type of detectors. One is the channel electromultiplier, that actually what it does, so here are the ions, and then they bound, well, they rebound into this funnel, producing secondary electrons that amplify the signal, and then we can actually have an amplified signal that we can record. The other one is the multi-channel plate detector that is normally mounted on time of flight systems with different holes that can multiplex the detection. And finally, in FT-based, uh, mass analyzers like the Orbitrap and the ICR, we actually don't have a specific detector or a separate detector. It's the same mass analyzer that actually do both things. So analyze the, <coughs> the mass and detects the mass because actually detection is the way on how these mass analyzers do the mass analysis. Okay, and then to end this session, so I want to say that actually commercial instruments especially for proteomic applications, that is the main focus of this course, actually combine different type of, of mass analyzers. And we will see in, in life all this, all, all what I'm going to present now afterwards uh, in the unit. But let me introduce some of, the, some of the real instruments that we have in the lab and so that you can see how complex they are. So this is a triple quadruple, right, from SciEx. And as the name says, it has to have three quadruples, right? So the main quadruples are this first one, second one, and third one. And this allows us to actually filter for a particular molecule that we want to do. Here in the second, we, we can fragment this molecule. We will see also all this fragmentation process and all this. And then I can filter again, okay? So the fact of having several uh, quadruples in line, what it allows me is to do several steps of filtering. And then also you can see here that there are other parts that looks like quadruples and actually they are quadruples, but they are not used as mass analyzers, but actually to focus and to uh, drive the ions into the real mass analyzer, which is this one. So here we have the electrospray, ions are entering here and somehow we have to take them and put them into the mass analyzer, right? So this, the, this function is done by these initial quadruples here. So a part of the triple, call, triple quadruple, we also have a QTOF. And as the, the name says, we expect it to have a quadruple and a TOF. Okay, so we have, again, several. So these first ones, these are quadruples that are used to guide the ions. Here we have the Q1, so the quadruple itself. 
Then another, that another, a second quadruple that we use to fragment peptides, and then we have the top with reflection. Okay, and we will see also this in, in the lab. Then we also have orbitrap-based instruments in which they combine. They are called LTQ orbitrap. Okay, or at least this is so for all of them, like th this QTOF. So there is the technical name, like QTOF, and the commercial name. That, for example, in this case, it's called triple TOF, which might think that it's three TOFs in a line, but actually it's a QTOF type of instrument. So orbitraps have also different names, and but the technical name would be linear trap quadruple. So it's a quadruple, or a linear trap based on a quadruple, which is this one, and the orbitrap. All the rest are things, quadruples, to actually guide ions into these two main mass analyzers. And finally, and you will also see, this is the last generation mass spectrometer that has appeared for proteomics or biomedical applications, which is the thermofusion LUMOS. So this will be the commercial name. The, the technical name is quadruple linear, qua, linear trap and orbitrap. And this means that this, so this is the first mass or mass spectrometer to combine three mass analyzers, right? So it has a quadruple, you can see it here very well. So it has a lot of other things here to, again, just to guide ions into this first quadruple. It has an orbitrap here, and at the back end, you have the linear trap, right? So quadruple, orbitrap, and linear trap here. And then we can, as we know already, which are the, 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 the oper or, or we understand very well how we can operate these, these, these different mass analyzers. So we can use, for example, the quadrupole to filter some, some specific peptides that I'm interested in and then analyze them in the orbit trap or, or do it in the, in the trap. And so we can play with the different characteristics of these mass analyzers to get the workflows and the, ma the, the mass spectrometry acquisition methods that, that are more beneficial to answer our biological questions. And if you think about this, this diagram or this shape, actually this is not so different as our third mass spectrometer in the world that had, again, the ion source, the mass analyzer, and the detector here. And with this, I would like to close this, this session thanking the website vendors and documentation well, the website of the vendors and their documentation because they actually have, as you have seen in these last slides, very nice diagrams of, of the instruments that, that we operate. And also one of the reference books in, in the field, which is mass spectrometry from J.H. Gross. And also Alex Leiner from ETH Zurich for his contributions on this, on this, on this session. Okay. So thanks a lot. And if there are questions. Uh, I don't know. I understood well, and in the orbital and the magnetic sectors, you said they don't have a separate detector, but they do still have a multi-channel plate, I mean the ultra, I mean, because that was the problem. But I, as I understood, the ions are not hitting the detector directly, but they kind of pass by it. Is it correct? Yeah, so for example, in this case, yes, this, so in the orbitrap, the detector itself will be here, around the, the orbitrap, to detect how they orbit. Okay, but then, so also in, in orbit trap like systems, you also have a second detector in the ion trap. And this is a real detect, I mean a separate detector. And sometimes, for example, in documentation, you can see that it can have another detector, and this is the one in the ion trap here. So it has, in this case, it would have two detector systems, one in the orbit trap itself and the other one next to the, the, the ion trap. Maybe. So, if I wanted, if I didn't have the this fine protein I wanted to look at, mm -hmm. I wanted to look at the everything. Yes. Then I would not use a quadruple. This is a very good conclusion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We'll see also how quadruple. So in after, so now we will have a break, coffee break, and afterward we will see uh, some. So how how we combine these and operate these mass spectrometers or mass analyzers to actually do this type of, of, of acquisition methods. And you will see also in, that in particular cases, it's also beneficial to, to have a quadruple for, for let's say, a screening proteomics. <laughs>